Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to year six. Thanks for coming out tonight. So um, this is a story that is close to my heart because um, I attempted and utterly failed to replicate this uh, technological achievement of the 18th century. So I know exactly how hard it is to accomplish and I am full of awe and wonder at uh, those who went so much more successfully before me. So I would like to invite all of you to come with me for an evening out in Paris. Um, the big impressive parts of the revolution are are over. It's still interesting around, but the guillotine isn't getting as much action as it, as it once did. So we have to ask ourselves, what should we do with ourselves? Where should we go? What should we see? Should we walk the streets with the heads of our fallen enemies on pikes? We've done that. Should we loot the ruins again? What about setting things on fire? But wait, there's still time for that. That's coming. Um, but I hear some ladies are, are hosting a salon across town. Are you kidding me? What we are going to do is we are going to go to the old abandoned Capuchin monastery where they are raising the dead. This evening is shaping up nicely. So you and I, we are going to walk together through the streets of Paris to Place Vendôme in the first arrondissement, and look for the slightly crumbling remains of the monastery where we find it with broken edges and firelight flickering in the depths, but otherwise darkened in the alcoves. The nuns were removed years ago and the capacious Gothic interiors have been taken over by artists and assorted denizens of the night. This is definitely the right place. We step inside into the gloom of the interior and a long and vaulted hallway greets us. It's hung with strange and monstrous works of art bizarre anamorphosis effects and tricks with mirrors, portraits that change animals to a face with the tug of a string, optical illusions and unsettling images half hidden in the dark. We tread lightly so as not to step on tombstones laid in the floor unless absolutely necessary. It is then that we first encounter the invisible woman. Tucked into an alcove, a glass coffin seems at first to be empty but then a soft voice emerges, a little rush of wind, is it breath? And then she speaks, she speaks from within the darkened space of the coffin. We lean in, it's certain, the voice is coming from inside, it is a young woman's voice, soft and breathy, and it can't be coming from anywhere else. We ask her questions, and she answers. We hold up objects, and she identifies them. We move on. And here at the end of the hallway, we're confronted with a door, a large and imposing door. On it, it is covered in Egyptian hieroglyphics. And we enter the inner sanctum and take our seats with the other intrepid souls here to witness the evening's, the evening's entertainment. And suddenly there is a, th a sound of thunderous storm, even though we are sure when we entered, it was clear outside. And then it's joined with the otherworldly music of a glass harmonica, a gaunt man approaches with a dramatic sideburns and a theatrical manner, and he tells us, what you are about to see with your own eyes, gentlemen, is by no means a frivolous spectacle. It is made for the thinking man, for the philosopher, who wishes to wander for a moment with Stern among the tombs. And then he summons the spirits and releases the demons. A storm crashes in fury outside all throughout. The candles go out in a rush. Phantoms emerge from the shadows and fly towards us. Skeletons dance and juggle their own heads. Monstrous creatures materialize out of thin air. It is both amazing and terrifying. It's a technological marvel and a theatrical masterpiece. It is Robertson's Phantasmagoria. Etienne Gaspard Robert, who called himself Robertson, and therefore, since it's easier, so shall I, uh, liked to say of his legendary ghost shows in which he summoned the spirits, I am only satisfied if my spectators, shivering and shuddering, raise their hands or cover their eyes out of fear of ghosts and devils dashing towards them. Robertson was a man of many talents and a dude I think many of us would like to get a beer with. He moved to Paris from Liege, Liege was then in, is now in Belgium, but was then part of France. He was trained as a physicist and he studied optics, but he moved to Paris just in time for the revolution, which seems like a strange choice, but there you go. 
While in Paris, he worked as a painter and a draughtsman, and he was also known to dabble in a little galvanism, experimenting with the effects of electricity on dead tissue, as one does as a hobby on the side. Also science, in 1796, in support of, his French, of the French government, he suggested a bold attack on the British sea vessels based on the legendary Mirrors of Archimedes. This illustration is from his memoirs. We are uh, disappointed to report that the government did not take him up on the suggestion because they don't like winning. <laughs> but... If he is known for one thing beyond the marvelous spectacle of the Phantasmagoria, it was for his balloon flights. He was an enthusiastic early, adop early adopter of the incredibly insane inventions of the Montgolfier brothers. He set a variety of altitude records. He flew over 50 flights. He conducted dozens of experiments on altitude with pigeons and butterflies. Um, he once flew 21 miles from Copenhagen to Roskilde without dying or having his balloon explode, which was considered a remarkable accomplishment at the time. Um, and he also designed his very own, very practical flying machines, as seen, as seen here. But really, in the end, it was his phantasmagoria that made him famous. Robertson's phantasmagoria was, at its heart, a magic lantern show. And magic lanterns were not new or even uncommon. These were small, fire-lit, often candle-lit lanterns that projected images from hand-drawn slides onto the wall. And they were popular entertainment for children and educational tools and lectures and scientific demonstrations. The exact first time somebody thought to take one of these lanterns to scare the crap out of people <laughs> is unknown, but the answer seems to be pretty much as soon as the technology was readily available, <laughs> this is where they went. This illustration is from 1420, showing up a, a demon projected from a lantern. The Dutch scientist Christian Huygens is generally credited with sorting out the optics that actually turned a regular lantern with maybe a shadow projection into something that could accurately project artwork onto a wall. And that was in the, the late 1600s. And you can see these are his sketches. And he pretty much immediately proposes a series of slides showing a skeleton removing and juggling his own head, which was a, a popular and frequently copied idea. And the Italian polymath Athanasius Kircher also played around with magic lanterns and the idea of summoning death and demons with lantern light. This is from one of his works. In Paris, it was another showman, also during the Revolution, who actually brought the phantasmagoria to life. There's a mysterious character by, who went by the name Paul Philidor. No one knows where he came from or who he really was, but he opened in 1792 a show he called Phantasmagoria, Apparition of Specters and Evocation of the Shades of Famous Personages, and it was a hit. It was Philidor who realized that the key to transforming a magic lantern slide show and the way that it was perceived was change from this to this by hiding the lantern behind a screen of waxed canvas in a darkened room. The paintings had the edges cut out on the sides, so they were all black around the edge, and it created the illusion of a ghostly lit being on an unknown surface. And it's almost certain that Robertson saw the infamous performances by Philidor. They were in the city at the same time. But Robertson set, set out to take what was merely effective and make it terrifying. And to do that, he would marry the science of optics, his skills as a painter, and a flair for the theatrical and the dramatically doomy to create his spectacle. He added a series of technological improvements to his phantasmagoria. The first was to take advantage of mechanical moving slides. He didn't invent them, they'd been around, but he used them to move eyeballs, uh, move eyeballs in the skull to dissolve one view from another, for example, from a beautiful young woman to the skeleton that she would become. Second, he swapped out candlelight for the much more powerful recently invented argon lamp, which was about eight times as bright. And in addition to the rear projection onto a screen in a darkened room, he took advantage of an old trick of projecting a mirror-bounced image onto plumes of smoke. I encourage you to go down this rabbit hole because this is a surprisingly effective trick that people are doing really interesting things with to this day. And it creates the effect of a free-floating phantom through which your hand may pass freely. He also discovered that he could create an eerie army of phantoms by adding multiple moving light sources. The slides he created were highly realistic and even customized. You could request to summon the spirit of a specific loved one 
as long as you gave him advance notice and a portrait so that they could work on the correct conjuring spells to bring them back from the dead. His biggest innovation was his pa patented Fantascope. It was a magic lantern on rails. And what this allowed him to do was for the unseen pr person operating the, the lantern, the projector, to move it physically closer and further away while adjusting the brightness and the focal point so he could make it appear as if demons or ghosts were approaching the, the captive audience, which was incredibly effective and one of the most commented on pieces of his phantasmagoria. But his stroke of genius was this the convent. He opened the Phantasmagoria in 1798 in a more traditional theater environment, but a year later he had this inspiration and he moved into the recently abandoned and partially ruined convent of the Capuchins. And it was there in the crumbling cloisters and the long gloomy hallways with the undisturbed graves underfoot that he, his legend really grew. And his ghost shows became legendary. According to some sources, he was briefly run out of town because of the fear that he might successfully raise the spirit of the recently de deposed, deceased, and unpopular king. <laughs> In his memoirs, he wrote that he viewed his foray into, fan into phantasmagoria as a scientific endeavor, as a way to figure out and demonstrate how the illusions were created as a challenge in optics. But for better or for worse, as soon as his success as a showman was assured, it undermined his role as a teacher. He became known for spectacle instead of science. But for years, Robertson made the devil's dance in front of terrified audiences in Paris and later beyond. His legacy long outlived him. In 1855, Charles Dickens, who is a big fan of ghost stories, he wrote about him saying, he was a charmer who charmed wisely a born conjurer, inasmuch as he was gifted with a predominant taste for experiments in natural science, and he was a useful man enough in an age of superstition to get up fashionable entertainments at which specters were to appear and horrify the public without trading on the public in ignorance of any false pretense. The popularity of the ghost shows spread and imitators sprung up in his wake, with new ghost shows adding new effects as they continue in each iteration. And his son, Eugene, toured this with his own ghost show in the United States. The most infamous innovation that came out of the Phantasmagoria is this. It's known as Pepper's Ghost. And it allows a real live actor to play the phantom by putting a light source underneath the stage and a slanted uh, piece of glass that the audience can't see in front of the stage. And it was such a huge success that According to some sources, all of the large sheet glass manufacturers in London were out of stock when this hit because every theater was competing to be able to have Hamlet's ghost really on stage. <laughs> so most of us have seen this. How many of you are familiar with this? This is a Pepper's ghost illusion. It's electrified, not done by lantern light, but Walt Disney and his Imagineers were huge fans of the Phantasmagoria, and the Haunted Mansion is probably the best modern incarnation of what those Phantasmagorias were like and what they felt like to pass through. And the illusions of Robertson and his colleagues also paved the way for what we would think of as theatrical horror, and the Grand Guignol, which took Paris by storm about 100 years later, was live action uh, plays that had blood and gore on stage. Eugene Gaspar Robert died in 1837 in Paris, his adopted home, and he's buried in Père Lachaise Cemetery in a tomb to be envied and admired. It's bedecked with winged skulls, and awe-inspiring balloon adventures without <laughs> death or explosions, yeah. and floating phantasms. It's an appropriate memorial for a life well and creatively lived, and to a man who turned his own life into a spectacle. And I would like to raise my glass to the memory of him and all the ghosts that he raised.